Phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
2023 coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. A standoff in the Mississippi courtroom as Republicans in that state want to expand this Capitol complex that really covers where all the white folks in Jackson, Mississippi live. Uh, of course, uh, they had a, a legal hearing today. We'll tell you exactly uh, what took place uh, in the courtroom. Also, folks, uh, we'll talk about uh, the issue of <laughs> what happens when uh, you cannot pronounce my name right? Well, guess what? It's a viral video coming out of the UK where a sister was like, nah, we ain't going on until you get my name right. Uh, so we're going to show you that video uh, as well. Also, uh, I can't stand when Washington, D.C. reporters ask stupid questions and they haven't even read the damn bill, but they want an answer. Damn, President Joe Biden just, just embarrassed a White House reporter. Wait till we show you that video. Uh, also, folks, the African American Mayors Association, uh, they've got a new president. She'll join us to talk about what her priorities are going to be. Also, we got a new show on the Black Star Network. Dee Barnes will join us to talk about her life, been, of course, a hip hop pioneer and uh, what's in store. Plus, lion ass George Santos. He got arrested today, and he said, I ain't quitting. Don't worry about it. You're going to prison, though. We'll tell you all about it. It's time to bring the funk on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best belief, he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. We've been telling y'all about this bill in Mississippi where Republicans want to expand uh, the state police force and also create their own court, if you will, for this particular area. Well, they went to court today and a judge is considering whether a section of this bill violates the state constitution. It's House Bill 1020. It would expand the jurisdiction of the state-run Capitol Police in Jackson and create a temporary court within the Capitol Complex Improvement District covering a portion of the city. Now, a lawsuit against this specifically takes issue with the requirement that Mississippi Supreme Court Chief Justice will be able to, be able to appoint four judges to the new temporary court in the Capitol Complex Improvement District. State lawmakers say the takeover is needed in Jackson, but opponents contend the measure lacks judicial authority under the state's law. Chancery Judge Dwayne Thomas said he could rule Friday or Sunday on the merits of the bill. Uh, Blake Feldman is Impact Policy Counsel for the Mississippi Center for Justice. He joins me now from Jackson. All right, Blake, here's what's crazy about this here. I have yet to see any data from any Republican that explains why they must expand this and why they need a separate court. I, I hear, oh, cr crime increase. But well, this is not covering all of Jackson. It's only around the Capitol. Right. So actually, what we're challenging is this new CCID court as an illegitimate court. But also throughout the state of Mississippi, you have circuit courts. Circuit court judges hear felonies. They hear serious criminal cases and serious civil cases. They are elected. All residents of all 82 counties in Mississippi get to elect their circuit court judges. Hines County, which is a majority black county that Jackson is within, has four elected circuit court judges. They are all black. What this bill requires is the chief justice to appoint four more circuit court judges. So instead of tens of thousands of majority black electorate, choosing their own judiciary 
Unlike the other 81 counties, in Hines, the white chief justice of the Supreme Court will be able to choose by himself four. That would be half of the circuit court bench. So that is those four temporary appointments that we are challenging. But like you said, on top of that, this bill has created this new Capital Complex Improvement District Court. It's an illegitimate court. It's not an inferior court, which is what uh, the state is trying to argue. And this would be where misdemeanor cases are held. So instead of the people of Jackson getting to elect their mayor who appoints a municipal court judge or electing county court judges, this is the chief justice choosing the judge for this brand new court that's unlike any court in the state of Mississippi where someone convicted of something like public disturbance or disturbing the peace, unlike anywhere else in the state, will be sent to state prison. Um, so for especially black residents of Jackson who have heard oral stories and oral history of the civil rights movement and what they did to people charged with disturbance of the peace, uh, being sent to parchment, 1020 says if you're convicted of those minor offenses in this brand new court with a judge appointed by the white chief justice and prosecutors appointed by the white attorney general, you will be sent to the Mississippi Department of Corrections. Okay, but here's what, I, what is still crazy to me. Okay, so they claim that this is needed because of dramatic increase in crime. Okay, why don't they simply then fund more courts for Jackson? Okay, we've been hearing from people saying that Jackson police are leaving the police department uh, to go to the state police. Okay, Republicans and legislature, fund more cops for Jackson. No, what this is, these are largely white Republicans in Mississippi who want to use their power to control an area of Jackson. They've been trying to take over the airport. They've been trying to take over. Now they want to, after the mayor went to DC, came to DC and got 600 million bucks, now they want to take over the water system. Uh, we can go on and on and on and on. We see this in uh, Missouri where Republicans want to take over the St. Louis Police Department. They want to take over the, uh, the circuit, uh, the circuit uh, uh, attorney's uh, position. That's one of the reasons why Kim Gardner resigned. This is, these are folks who do not believe in local control when they are not in control. Yes, uh, they, this bill really demonstrates uh, the legislature of Mississippi uh, does not trust giving resources to black-led cities, to black-led counties, and they do not trust the vote with black people. It's paternalistic. It's white supremacist. It's we know better than you, um, and this is how we think uh, the city should be run. Um, as far as data that's been provided, uh, there is none. Actually, a uh, past version of, or the current version, says by next year, data has to be handed over to the legislature for them to decide if the caseloads in the Hines County Circuit Court merit there being five circuit court judges instead of four. So they're saying, if you give us data that shows that you need five elected judges instead of four, we'll give it to you. Oh, oh so stop right there. I'm confused. Uh, hold up, hold up. Not, wait, I'm confused. I'm confused. So you got a year to give us data if you need a fifth court. But without any data, we're going to create four courts. Oh, by the way, Jackson residents, y'all going to pay for these four courts and then we're going to figure it out. That's as backwards. Exactly. Uh, it's with judges, but it is the circuit court benches for elected judges. They're saying, if you show us data that it needs to be five in the largest county in the state instead of four, we will give you one more elected. But without presenting that data, we are deciding that you do need four appointed. Uh, so half of the bench will be elected, whereas 100% of the circuit court bench is elected in all the other counties. But in Hines County, you get to elect half, and you are under the jurisdiction 
of the other half, which are just appointed by one man who happens to be a white man who is not elected by the people of Hines County or Jackson, Mississippi. Wow. All right, Bruce. Uh, we appreciate it. We look forward to the judge, judge's ruling. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, we're going to talk about it with our panel when we come back from this break. You're watching Roller Mark Unfiltered, the Black Star Network. You're watching on YouTube. Hit that like button, y'all. That's right, hit the like button. Uh, of course, it impacts the algorithm, so we want to easily hit 1,000 likes, so please do that. Don't forget, you can also download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Uh, your dolls are important for us to be able uh, to do what we do, to travel the country, reporting on the stories that absolutely matter. Uh, and so send your chicken money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinmartinunfiltered.com. And don't forget, get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available at bookstores nationwide. Of course, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target. Download your copy on Audible. We'll be right back. Right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hi, I'm Gavin Houston. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. All right, let's get it. Robert Patillo, he is host of People, Passion, Politics, News Talk, 1380 WAOK in Atlanta. Rebecca Carruthers, she is the vice president, Fair Election Center based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Scott Bolden, uh, he is an attorney in Washington, D.C. and belongs to a youth group, so-called fraternity. All right, so let's get right to it here. Uh, so, uh, Scott, I guess I'll start with the kappa. Uh, look, let's just be real clear. Republicans are doing this all around the country. They are using their power in control of the legislature to control what's happening locally. In Tennessee, they, they've been trying to take over the sports authority. They've been trying to take over the airport. Uh, in, Flo in Florida and Alabama, Mississippi, they passed laws saying, oh, you can't remove Confederate monuments on the local level unless it's, you get permission from us, even if it's on city grounds. Uh, we see what's happening, uh, how Texas is trying to pass laws specifically for Harris County and not the other 253 counties uh, in Texas. That's what Republicans are doing right here in Mississippi. Yeah, Roland, I can't get past what you're wearing on the show tonight. I got a white cape. 
You get over it. Share that I can share with you. What? A really white one too. First from of all, Kappa Step Show I had 30 that, years ago. That will but never be. You great. will never see me with a red cape. Uh, no, it's a white cape. It's a white cape. Well, but well, anyway, I'll, but, I'll but, but trust me, I, I'll, I'll rock that at the Delta convention where that's that's <laughs> that's the only red and white that I respect. In any event, let me tell you what I think is really going on here. I think you're I think you're right about the legislature's trying to do this on the Republican side. But but Hines County feels like this is an experiment the Republican legislature and the Republican uh, governor are going to try out. And his appointees are going to hash out or, or hand out very harsh sentences because most white conservatives believe the more you lock them up and the longer you lock them up, the crime will go down. That's why they want those statistics. The reality is Washington, D.C. has some of the highest lockup rates in the country, and yet crime continues to flow. Locking people up forever is not the answer. But secondly, there are other majority black counties in Mississippi, I presume, and if this idea works in Hines County, look for the legislature to try to expand it on these appointed judges, on people they know are going to sentence uh, bad actors the way they want them sentenced as a means of campaigning on we shut crime down by appointing judges versus letting black people elect them. I think really underlying that's what's going on. And if it is, that's even more dangerous than what you're talking about. See, Rebecca, one of the reasons why these, these white Republicans in Mississippi can do this is because of the shameful actions of the U.S. Supreme Court in invalidating uh, Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act and the Shelby v. Holder decision. That cleared the way for them to do the crap like this, and that's how they may, they've, been, they've been able to get away with it. You know, Roland, there's two things that are going on. I've spoke about it on the show before, is that what we're witnessing is American um, apartheid, and we really got to keep our eyes open about this and fight this and fight it like hell. The second thing is, this is also a money grab, because as you know, in Mississippi, there are four profit private prisons in Mississippi, including private prisons owned by Core Civic, and I'm going to go there, where, where Thurgood Marshall Jr. sits on the board. So this, we're seeing white supremacy. We're also seeing some black folks who are a part of this, but this is also about money, because the more folks who get thrown into prison, the more money these uh, for-profit private prisons make, because they make money per capita, per person there. The only way you get more people in prison is if you figure out out more ways to jail and imprison people. And that's what we see that's happening in Mississippi. Um, the, the, the thing that's also crazy here, Robert, is that they're taking this action but telling Jackson residents, oh, y'all got to pay for this. Uh, absolutely. And I've talked for the last couple years about this slow-moving fascist coup that we're seeing taking place nationwide. And this is just another brick in that wall. What Republicans realized in 2008 was they will no longer be able to win national elections. They will no longer be able to get the popular vote. They will no longer be able to control the government through democratic means. And they launched this fascist coup that was very, very slow-moving. Uh, we, we saw during the Obama years over a 1,000 seats switched from Democrat to Republican nationwide, despite population growth among minorities and a population decline among the traditional voter base of Republicans. This is because of voter suppression. This is because of gerrymandering. This is because uh, we don't have a protected right to vote in this country uh, after the Shelby v. Holder decision. And, and uh, as a result of that, we see the constitutional uh, majorities for conservatives in state houses around the country. They use those constitutional majority to elect African Americans from the state house in Tennessee, to bar transgender women from serving in the state house in Minnesota, to try to remove a, a Democratic judge from the Supreme Court uh, in a state like Wisconsin or in a state like Mississippi to take power away from the African Americans of those communities and create a, uh, a, a, a occupation force um, that we haven't seen in America since the Posse Cabotada is meant to, um, to take away Democratic means. And unless we concentrate on these state and local elections, win back these state houses nationwide, we're going to continue to see all the action in America take place on the state level because of the gridlock we have in Washington, D.C., the uh, recalcitrance to work across party lines, the inability to move big legislation, everything over the next decade is going to be happening in state houses. And right now, Republicans control those because they've invested in those for the last two decades. And the thing that I have consistently said to people, Scott, and, and over and over and over again, if you sit your ass at home, then you are clearing the way for the folks who hate you to do whatever it is they want. 
or just voting in presidential elections as opposed to state elections. You and I and others on this panel have, have yelled and screamed it forever since we've been doing this show and even before about how important it is to vote up and down the ballot in both federal national elections as well as state elections because our community is the first one to complain when a state's attorney does something we don't agree with or a judge does something we don't agree with or a governor or a state legislature. So that's really important. But remember this on this uh, Hines County thing. This TRO they won was just temporary, temporary restraining order, and there's going to be an evidentiary hearing whereby the plaintiffs are going to have to present evidence as to why this is unconstitutional. That case and the presentation of that evidence will be really, really important because that TRO is going to run out. They're holding the status quo right now, but this TRO does not affect the governor's ability to appoint these judges in Hines County. The judge is going to deal with that when he, when he makes his ruling after hearing uh, evidence in the case from both sides. So I hope you continue to report on this, and I hope we continue to watch what's going on in Hines County, because you're going to see it again in Mississippi and perhaps other southern states. Yeah, we're going to absolutely keep reporting on it, because the bottom line is it ain't getting reported on on CNN. Or the, the, look, they speak, yeah. they busy trying to give a town hall with Donald Trump. Uh, it's not being talked about extensively on MSNBC. It's not being talked about other places, which is why I keep trying to explain to people why you got to have black-owned media. Because the reality is we've got to understand what is going on. We are connecting the dots. This is not solely just about Hines County, Jackson, Mississippi. This literally is where Republicans have a supermajority and where they control the House, the Senate, and the governor's mansion. So we're definitely going to continue to do that. All right, y'all got to go to a break. We'll be back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Uh, again, YouTube folks, hit the like button. Folks want to do, do the same thing on our OTT app. Speaking of the OTT app, please download the Black Star Network app. Keenan, send me a text. Let me know how many downloads we have. Uh, download the app, y'all. Here, here's why. Here's why you download the app. All right, so we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're streaming on Twitch, we're streaming on Instagram, uh, but the reality is this here. If any of those platforms do anything where they don't like something, they can take us off, we control our OTT app. So we've almost at 1.1 million subscribers on our YouTube channel. We should have a million people who have downloaded our app. This is about controlling our voice, being able to be in complete control of telling our story. And so all of you who are watching right now, download the Blackstone Network app on all your devices. And we're on all of them, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And y'all, it's no cost, it's free. All you got to do is sign up with an email. It is no cost at all. Uh, so please do so. And don't forget, your dollars are critically important. We are fighting the fight when it comes to advertisers. I saw a story the other day where 40 major advertisers have returned to Fox News at, at 8 p.m. since they got rid of Tucker Carlson. P&G, Allstate, and others. Hmm. So I guess if they can advertise on Fox News, they can advertise on this show. My folks are reaching out to them as we speak, but we still need your support. Uh, everybody who gives during the show, I'm going to give you a shout out uh, during the show as well, live on the air. And so check and money orders, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available bookstores nationwide. Download on Audible. I'll be right back. That was a pivotal, pivotal time. I remember mm. Kevin, Kevin Hart telling me that. Um, He's like, man, what you doing, man? You got to stay on stage. And I was like, yeah, well, I ain't got to. You know, I'm young, think I'm there, I'm good. <clears throat> and he was absolutely right. What, 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 what show was you other time? This was one-on-one. -on -one got during it. During that time. I, and I was, so, you, so you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, yep. going great. Yeah. You're making money. You're like, I'm like, I don't need to leave. I don't, I don't need to leave from, you know, third, Wednesday, Thursday to Sunday. I, I, you know, I, I just I didn't want to do that. You know, it was just like, I'm going to stay here. Or oh, I didn't want to. 
can finish work Friday, fly out, go do a gig Saturday, Sunday. I was like, I don't have to do that. And, and I lost a little bit of that hunger that I had mm. in New York. I would hit all the clubs, run around. I, you know, sometimes me and Chappelle, or me and this one or that one, we'd go to the comedy cellar at one in the morning. And I mean, that was our life. We loved it. You know, you do two shows in Manhattan, go to Brooklyn, leave Brooklyn, go to Queens, go to Jersey. And I kind of just, I got complacent. I was like, I got this money, I'm good. I don't need to go, I don't need to go chase that because that money wasn't at the same level that I was making, but what I was missing was that training. Yes. Was that, was that. And it wasn't the money. It was the money, you know, it was that, that's what I needed. on The Frequency with me, Dee Barnes, our special guest, Alicia Garza, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. We're going to discuss her new book, The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart. We live in a world where we have to navigate, you know, when we say something, people look at us funny, but when a man says the same thing less skillfully than we did, right? Right. <laughs> Everybody boxed towards what they said, even though it was your idea. Right here on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. Hi, I'm Eric Nolan. I'm Shantae Moore. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. George Santos, a re elected a Republican from uh, Long Island. Uh, Y'all, I don't even think his name is George. He been lying about everything. Well, guess what? Homie got a hit uh, with 13 uh, indictment, uh, 13 counts, turned himself in today, uh, was arrested, had a news conference where he was defiant. I'm not resigning, I'm not quitting, even though there are an increasing number of Republicans are saying, yo, it's time for this dude uh, to go. Seven counts of wire fraud, three counts of money laundering, one count of theft of public funds, two counts of making materially false statements to the House of Representatives. Punk ass Kevin McCarthy says, oh, no, well, no, he's, he's gonna stay in until, you know, until, until he got, he's indicted, but until he's convicted, Really, dude? Really? Talk about weak. They had a crazy, insane news conference today. Listen to this nutcase talking today outside the courthouse. The reality is, is it's a witch hunt because it, it, it makes no sense that in four months, four months, five months, I'm indicted. You have Joe Biden's entire family receiving Deposits from nine, nine family members receiving money from foreign, from foreign destinations into their bank accounts. It's been years of exposing. A lot of you here have reported on them, and yet no investigation is launched into them. I'm going to fight. I well, and I'm just going. I'm getting back to that. I'm going to fight my battle. I'm going to deliver. I'm going to fight the witch hunt. I'm going to take care of clearing my name, and I look forward to doing that. Yo, this dude lying, 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 Robert. And he's like, after four months, duh. First of all, 700 grand, where'd that come from? 
<laughs> well, oh, look, Roland, this is one of the, uh, the big things that Plato warned us about in the Republic when discussing the, uh, the descent of democracy into tyranny, that when you have the, the rise of demagoguery over the conceptualization of veracity, uh, at some point in time, anyone who's a skillful orator or actor uh, can deceive the public. And this is one of the weaknesses of our democratic system. There's absolutely no check and balance on somebody who lies their way into office, as we've seen. If you have a weak House leader, uh, someone like a Kevin McCarthy who's holding on by the, the uh, slimmest of majorities, who knows if George Santos steps down from office, then that seat will more than likely be uh, go to a Democrat, um, that it will weaken his uh, hold on power, willing to sell himself out to the lowest common denominator. And the fact that we have a political system now where you can hear the echoes of Trump in every corrupt politician in this country, they, uh, they know the playbook from Trump. You lie, you say it's a witch hunt, you say people are after you, you discredit the investigation, you try to deflect it onto some other conspiracy theory, and George Santos at this point in time needs to be working on a plea agreement uh, as opposed to trying to fight this out or run for re-election, because in reality, more than likely, we will see a superseding indictment in this case where more evidence is, uh, is uh, found, because as you said, we still don't know where these several hundred thousand dollars came from. We do not know much of where uh, who paid for his campaign, and he has been voting on important issues in the House of Representatives for four months right now. We do not know who has been directing those votes and who's, who owns George Santos, and that's be a scary thing for everybody who is part of our democratic system. This thing here, uh, I'm telling you right now, uh, Rebecca, uh, is uh, hilarious. And why Republicans, so, why is McCarthy so scared to move? Because they have a slim majority, and they know if he resigns or is forced out, there's a special election, Democrats are winning that seat. You know, I don't know which is worse here, Kevin uh, McCarthy's feckless leadership or New York Democrats losing to Santos. That, to me, is the biggest loser in all this. How do you lose to this guy? Like, just finding out about his antics are just simply incredible. Like, allegedly, he stole money from a, um, a, a, a wounded veteran and his dog. Like, who does that? This is really like the scraping the bottom of the barrel. And then to Robert's point, we don't know who owns George Santos, who's paying for this lavish lifestyle. I mean, we now know who owns Clarence Thomas, but it is a big problem when we have um, folks who are in federal office who are um, entitled and owned by a bunch of people, and we don't we, we don't know you know where we we don't know who he's beholden to. But beyond that, you know, it's very clear from um, the indictments that this guy he has to go, and Kevin McCartney need to really just throw him out. Uh, and, and I tell you, Scott, other Republicans are like, "Yo, we're tired of this dude. We're tired of this dude." I think it's going to build, and again. The lies have been compound that they've been compounded and building and building. Like I say, I don't even know the man's name actually is George. Um, I think he's mentally ill. You know, I've been doing criminal defense work for 32 years. I'm prosecutor for four more years, so 36 years. I think he's mentally ill. And if this is a witch hunt, the warlock just got caught with 13 count federal indictment. And those seven uh, wire fraud charges are charges of him wiring money to his personal account and elsewhere, probably political contributions, the, uh, the money laundering, they're hiding sources. He's hiding and burying the sources of that money. And then the stealing of public funds is an unemployment, um, unemployment compensation um, charge that says he lied to get unemployment insurance payouts which is really, really sick, given what he's reported to the House and, and to the House in regard to his, um, you know, his disclosures. And so this is a very simple case to prove. And I'm not sure why he stand out there and going to fight, because other than him being mentally ill, this is a simple case to prove. He ought to enter into plea negotiations, get as little... Uh, time as he can and keep it moving. The problem is he's been defiant to the system. And watch this. He would never have been charged. He would never have been charged if he had just not only admitted that he lied, and he has admitted, he's an admitted liar already, but if he just withdrew from the race or stepped down from Congress when it came out. He would never have been charged by the government. 
When you stay in and self-perpetuate this fraudulent behavior, you're inviting the government, especially the DOJ or U.S. attorney, to indict you, to investigate you. You're almost begging them, please come get me, because I can't save myself from myself. And that's really what's going on here. Uh, well, we'll see exactly uh, what they're doing. I, I got to ask y'all this here. Uh, we've got a Harlan Crow who refuses to turn over um, what gifts that he gave to Clarence Thomas to uh, the United States Senate. Uh, we now know that he, he's been paying for the private tuition uh, of uh, the adopted child of Clarence Thomas. The man bought Clarence Thomas' mama's crib, and, uh, uh, and she ain't got to pay rent. He's been taking lavish trips with his billionaire. Uh, one website actually reported uh, in a case dealing with Chevron that Clarence Thomas reversed his own decision in that case after getting all his money for Harlan Crow. Uh, it is building and building and building, uh, Scott, uh, these, uh, this, uh, this case against Clarence Thomas. And, and, J and John Roberts refused to come before the United States Senate. Uh, these people are going to have to do something. This is an absolute massive ethics uh, violation, conflict of interest. We now know that the Supreme Court, damn that, they cannot be allowed to police themselves. They are not... If we're going to talk about three branches of government, there is not a single branch of government other than them where they get to police themselves. These folks need to be under far more scrutiny, and they need to be having a hell of a lot more, frankly... Uh, uh, ethics uh, rules in place than even the executive branch or uh, the legislative branch. Yeah, the Supreme Court can't really be supreme if it's acting this badly. And the real danger with the Clarence Thomas situation, and it's not a Republican appointee or Democratic appointee, this, this ethics piece should cover all of them. And Roberts ought to come up with some ethical guidelines, and we ought to figure out whether the ABA or DOJ can police those guidelines. But here's the danger in Harlan Crow, though, because Harlan Crow may not have anything pending before the Supreme Court, but you don't know whose interest Harlan Crow is representing by disclosing, by, by giving these gifts and investing these monies and adding value to Clarence Thomas's life. And by the way, has Clarence Thomas reported these gifts or this income or any of these transactions on his taxes? That's the real question to ask, because whether he had to report them or not, as part of some ethical review or document, which doesn't exist, has he reported on his taxes? And so Roberts has got to come up with something, because this is bringing disgrace on the Supreme Court. And if you, if you, if we can't believe, only 50 percent of Americans in some recent polling believe that the Supreme Court makes sense or the Supreme Court is the supreme uh, determiner of the law and they have confidence in it. Now you're losing something worse on the democracy because you've got politics in the legislature and the executive branch, yeah, but this isn't a political branch of the government. This is supposed to be bigger, better, brighter, and uphold the law because we follow the law, right? If we stop following the law, we have anarchy. And so this is a bigger problem for the Supreme Court. It's very credibility, which is the linchpin for our democracy. They got to get it fixed. Well, uh, go to my iPad. Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, uh, this is what he said. Uh, this is from a political story. Uh, he said, although Thomas neglected to report the gifts on his annual disclosure forms, Wyden argued they were substantial enough that Crow would have been obligated to report them on his annual gift tax returns to the IRS. Rebecca, I mean, and so this billionaire, oh yeah, I, I'm not answering y'all questions. Uh, Why is right? Now nah, you don't get to just blow off a Senate committee just because you're rich. You know, what's really interesting in this is not only um, does uh, Arlen have to deal with the gift taxes, but Clarence Thomas might have to deal with um, the gift taxes on the receiving end as well. You know, I think Justice um, Roberts is in quite a quandary. I personally think that if this was just Clarence Thomas running amok ethically on the Supreme Court, they would have been cut Clarence Thomas and, you know, Clarence Thomas would have been on his way out. 
I suspect that this is a larger issue on the Supreme Court. There are questions around Brett Kavanaugh and some of the debts that were paid off for him and substantial debts, um, debts that his um, salary that he was making prior to joining the court simply didn't make sense Those that he could afford to personally pay off those debts. Those questions came up during the confirmation hearings. Those questions have lingered um, since he's been on the court. So I think Roberts is having having a quandary here, because it may be more than just um, Thomas who have these ethical issues. Oh, uh, bottom line, Robert, is, uh, look, uh, you, you are unelected. You are appointed for life. You should have a greater level of scrutiny. And for him to say, oh, well, I, I, I just asked around, and it was, <laughs> he sounded like, hey, uh, do you think I could take this trip? Um, Oh, I can? All right, cool. So uh, a friend of mine said I could. What the hell? It's not like he even said he consulted with his attorney. He literally said, yeah, I just asked a friend. The friend was like, yeah, you go ahead and do that, Clarence. Go ahead, bro. Uh, oh, you know, it's amazing. For the first time in U.S. history, we have confirmation that Supreme Court justice has a sugar daddy. And I don't think that's something that any of us uh, had to study in law school or really expected. This idea of having a Supreme Court just to get flued out like an Instagram thought is it, just not, not something within the realm of reality. When you think about the gravity of the cases that the Supreme Court is voting on, uh, whether or not uh, we're, well, us having voting rights is dependent on if Clarence Thomas gets a trip to the Maldives, whether or not women have the right to reproduction depends Depended on if Clarence Mama's house gets paid off, uh, whether or not we have uh, a prayer in school is dependent on whether or not uh, Clarence Thomas's son gets into, uh, gets his tuition paid. It's an insane system that we exist in. The reason I brought up Plato in the last segment is this goes at the very foundations of our democratic system. Uh, when you have uh, a congressperson who apparently uh, uh, is living a fake life, but yet and still uh, is in Congress, we have a president who's a uh, former president who's convicted of sexual abuse and defamation, and before. Before that can even get out of the news cycle, we find out that we have a Supreme Court justice that is a, a, a gold digger. You know, all those things pile up to really question the democratic system that we exist within. And that's when you start seeing societies break from the just weight of the corruption of the system around them. And I think we may be near that breaking point. Damn, Robert, IG thought a gold digger. I mean, I, did, did you use all of the descriptions up? Hell, I, I thought you I thought you was about to say Harlan Crow gave him a, a a gold car to Magic City. I mean, my goodness. Look. Uh, look, I, you, there's nobody at Magic City getting flued out to the Maldives, their house paid for, and tuition for their grandbaby. Maybe at Claremont Lounge, but I'm just saying, that's not, that he's getting paid more than any IG thought that we know, and he gets to decide if we get the vote or not. Damn, Robert sitting time by a clan. Can I get a table dance? Can I get a table dance? All right, let's go to a break. When we come back. Uh, President Joe Biden just straight embarrasses a White House reporter. If I was that reporter's boss, her ass ain't asking no more questions in a news conference. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network, the blackest show on the blackest network in the land. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. 
Hi, I'm Pastor Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. What's up, what's up? I'm Dr. Ricky Dillard, the choir master. Hey, yo, peace world. What's going on? It's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. So yesterday, I, did y'all, I hope y'all saw on our YouTube channel where I just torched this dumbass black conservative named David Lowry who came on here. He didn't have no facts. He didn't read nothing. Hell, he didn't even look at no pictures to understand what the hell he was talking about. And I just cannot stand when people say stuff and they don't even bother to read something before they open a damn mouth. That literally happened yesterday in a news conference where President Joe Biden took a question from a reporter who didn't know what the hell she was talking about, and even Biden was like, damn, you ain't the brightest bulb in a dark room. Roll it. Speaker McCarthy said that he asked you numerous times if there was anywhere in the federal budget for cuts, but he did not get an answer. So is there I got a specific answer. I got a specific answer again today. Which is what? first... I, well, you didn't listen either, so why should I even answer the question? I, we cut the deficit. Damn! Like, damn! You ain't listen either. I don't know why I should even talk to your ass. I'm, I'm a big Biden's translator. Why are y'all, I'm even talking to your simple Simon ass? Play. By $160 billion. Billion. B-I-L-L-I-O-N. Uh, Damn, now you know somebody just, just pimp slapping you when they spell that shit out. He literally spelled out billion to her ass. Play. Dollars on the Medicare deal. We cut the deficit by raising the tax on people making uh, 55 corporations that made $40 billion to 15%, and the list goes on. So... But in terms of what he is proposing, is there any room for negotiation? What's he proposing? Did he tell you? He, he talked about... No, 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 I'm not being facetious. Did he tell you what he's proposing? He, he was talking about the bill. Yeah, but what, what does it propose? Do you know? I'm not being a wise guy. You all are very, very informed people. Do you know what that bill cuts? By basically, like, what your ass got? What you got? Then, the man literally just embarrassed her. Ooh, y'all really are really informed people. What he was saying is, your ass don't know shit. Press play. There is a long list of things that it, it cuts. That no, no, it doesn't say. It says, does it say what it's going to cut? Or just... Damn. Her ass said, there's a long list of things it says it cuts. By like, what it at? Play. Say generically it's going to cut. Get the problem. Just, Rebecca, I don't know who that reporter was, but her boss should say, your ass in the timeout box. You know, I don't understand why reporters ask questions that they don't already know the answer to. Like, to me, it, it, that's the first thing. The second thing is don't carry any, any other person's water. Just because you heard someone summarize something and you, you don't, don't take that as fact, do your own research. And Biden was right here. You know, what she was asserting, what she was carrying forth, what she heard from the speaker was inaccurate. And he... He embarrassed her. So, you know, I hope her um, editor has a really good, long conversation with her while she really needs to do research, you know, before asking the president of the United States a question that simply is not so, that's based upon a faulty premise.
You see, Robert, this is the bullshit that happens all the time in this city. They'll be at the White House go, uh, some people are saying, and I love it when they go, who? Can you name them? Who, who, who some people? Uh, what, what they say. You should not... See, that's why, there's a reason why, now, see, no, Robert, you know, I guess because you love your guns, these black Republicans love to come on when you guest host because they're not going to bring their asses on here when I'm here because the bottom line is uh, they lying. And what, what, what they're not used to, they're not used to, first of all, journalists who actually read stuff who can also recite it to them in real time. Well, this was Biden's way of saying, don't ask me no damn question about what's in the bill when there's nothing in the bill. And so when she's like, it's a host of cuts, he's like, what? She couldn't even answer it. So even she didn't do her job by saying, McCarthy, show us a copy of your bill so we can actually know what you're proposing cutting. Well, you know, this is part of the problem with what the way Republicans have tried to paint Joe Biden over the course of the last couple of years uh, by having this idea of Sleepy Joe, this, uh, you know, Dementia Joe, some guy who's barely standing up, can barely get by. They forget that Joe Biden is still sharp and still much smarter than many of them. And because of that, he can go toe to toe with many of these reporters. And I think that this is one of the things the White House com te comms teams needs to be uh, to get together on, because quite frankly, uh, we're talking about this right here. How many other networks are talking about this from today? How many surrogates from the Biden administration or, out, or from the Biden uh, campaign team are out uh, putting out talking points on this, sharing the clip online? How uh, what, you, In the last week or so, we have Joe Biden proposing a very uh, reasonable budget, trying to maintain our uh, our debt rally, rating across the world. At the same time, you got Donald Trump getting, uh, getting uh, convicted. You got George Santos getting arrest, arrested. And we find out about Clarence Thomas's sugar daddy. Uh, the White House needs to have a better way of carrying their message forward to the American people, you shouldn't have to go look for the message. There should be somebody from the White House right here on this show right now talking about this moment. And unless they can do that, they're going to continue to see Biden polling in the mid-30s. It's not because of the actions of the administration, it's because of the inability of them to carry that message to the American people and enter into the cultural zeitgeist in order to actually have some resonance around it to uh, boost the administration's poll numbers. Hey, Scott, he don't, he don't even say, he should stop even saying, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. No, he should let that thing sting. In fact, you know what? If, if, if there's somebody who Biden should be watching every night, Scott, I think President Biden, every before he does a news conference, should watch this. Let's see if I can get it. Yes, what, what is it? Mr. President. Yeah, what? <laughs> Mr. Bigby, Mississippi Herald. Sit down. Oh. Yeah, what is it? Mrs. Fenton Carlton Macker, Christian Women's News. Mr. President, since you've become president, you've been seen and photographed on the arms of black women. Oh. <laughs> Quite frankly, sir, you've been courting an awful lot of white women. Will this continue? As long as I can keep it up. Uh, <laughs> I mean, oh, at some point, him? Scott, he's got to say, I'm sick of this shit. I ain't dealing with this nonsense. And you got to just go ahead and do that when you keep getting ass stupid stuff. The greatest. Let's not forget. Richard Pryor was the greatest. <laughs> he just proved it there. You know, every week I'm on some network defending Joe Biden, and the Republican narrative, uh, political narrative, is that he's old, he's slow, he's not sharp, he's got all these gaps. And if you heard his presentation today um, in, I want to say, Hawaii or wherever he was, in Ohio somewhere, I can't remember, he gave a speech at a press conference. This clip that you just ran, where he's breaking down the budget, this is an extremely intelligent man with a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience. And sure, he's 80 years old, or maybe 82 when he, when he wins again. But I got to tell you, I'll take Joe Biden's wisdom and experience and his knowledge and experience of the budget, as well as international affairs and all that he's done for this country 
over whatever the Republican Party has to offer. And that's just simply not much compared to him. He's a human, decently, he's a humanly decent man. He's super smart, still sharp. And he just showed you in that clip you showed, as well as his speech and press conference today, that he's sharp as ever. I mean, I have gaps when I present, and I'm 60 years old, so I don't think it makes a difference whether you're 80 or 60, but he's an incredibly competent president, gets a lot done, and regardless of what the Republicans throw at him, uh, his excellence manifests itself every day. And so that's why he's going to get reelected again, I think. Oh, well, um, that's nice, but uh, I don't have no gaps. So, I mean, that's, you know I mean? Maybe you can think. It's Put time on your own show. What are you talking No, I ain't, ain't. I'm just saying. I, time. I'm just saying, you might want to prepare more. <laughs> you might, you might want to put. You a missed your cue about five shows you may, ago. You may, I, you I may, never you, said anything you may about it. You may want to put a little extra work in. Uh, and remember, <laughs> I set the cues. <laughs> See? See? Don't let me have to remind you who your daddy is. All right. Well, maybe it was a couple years ago. Maybe it was a couple years ago. I remember, Alf was your daddy. Bow down. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. So don't, 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 don't get, don't do it. Get started. All right. Got to go to a break. We come back. We're going to talk to the new president of the African American Mayors Association, D. Barnes, the hip hop pioneer journalist. has a new show on the Black Star Network. We're talking to her and a black tech company. Uh, we'll also be talking to them in the next hour. So jam pack hour. Y'all stick around. We got some great stuff for you. Ain't no show like us. Y'all don't have to waste y'all time watching MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, ABC, CBS, NBC. Look, y'all might, look, if y'all look at, uh, Henry, give me the panel. Y'all ain't gonna see this many black people at one time on any of these networks unless somebody black gets arrested. It ain't gonna happen. So y'all know how it is. And so we break it down, we keep it real, we keep it honest. That's why we need y'all on the YouTube channel. Hit the like button. I see several thousand y'all on there. We should have several thousand likes right now. Download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Also support us uh, by joining our Brina Funk fan club. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average 50 bucks a year. That's $4.19 a month, 13 since today. It'll raise a million dollars. That's critically important for us to keep doing what we do. So please support us. Check in money orders. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 20037-0196. Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rolling S Martin.com. Rolling at rolling Martin Unfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Up next on The Frequency with me, D. Barnes, we're going to talk to Leslie Seagar, a.k.a. Big Les, and talk about her incredible career as a dancer, choreographer, and VJ of Rap City. Magic Johnson was there, so half the NBA was there. Iman the supermodel, so all the supermodels were there every day. After right. Like, it was a who's who of who's who right here on The Frequency in the Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr, we look at one of the most influential and prominent Black Americans of the 20th century. His work literally changed the world. Among other things, he played a major role in creating the United Nations. He was the first African American and first person of color to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And yet today, he is hardly a household name. We're talking, of course, about Ralph J. Bunch. A new book refers to him as the absolutely indispensable man. His lifelong interest and passion in racial justice, specifically in the form of colonialism. And he saw his work as uh, an activist, an advocate uh, for the black community here in the United States, as just the other side of the coin of his work trying to roll back European empire in Africa. Author Cal Rastiala will join us to share his incredible story. That's on the next Black Table, here on the Black Star Network. This is Judge Math. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Mac Wild. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Eee.
Welcome back to Roland Martin on the Filter of the Black Star Network. And you know what, Scott? Since you got a little extra at the last segment there, Orlando Jones hit me up and said, remind Scott of what I said in the movie Biker Boys. Don't be stuttering and standing your ass around. Get down on your knees and bow that ass down. What? <laughs> That's for all you cappers, Scott. All right. <laughs> you always got to bow down when you're in the presence of an alpha, Scott. See? I, see, I told you. Leave me alone. What? What you got to say? I'm going to sue you for that one. I'm just telling you. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to send you the lawsuit before I sue you. Okay? That's right. And I'm going to sue the alphas and you. And the Roland Martin Unfiltered Show. That's right. I'm you, coming for you, Roland. You done? I'm coming for you. You done? You done? Yeah, I'm done. I got a whole bunch of alphas who handle. Take that back. I got a whole take bunch of alphas back. handling. That wasn't nice. I got a bunch of alphas handling. Back. Okay, what you say? Take it back. Take it back. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't run it back. Oh, y'all thought back. you said run it back. Boom. Oh, take it back. No. Standing <laughs> your ass around. <laughs> Get down on your knees and bow that ass down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Since you, since you, since you want to run it back, that's, that's how we do it. Take it back. That's how we do it. All right. Enough of that. All right. Let's get to it, y'all. A couple of weeks ago, the African American Marriage Association, they were in town for their uh, national conference. Uh, uh, my alpha brother, uh, uh, mayor of Arkansas, Scott, uh, is the outgoing president. An alpha, just letting you know. In fact, there were so many alpha mayors uh, at the conference, there could have been a fraternity meeting. But the new mayor, the new uh, head of the organization, she's out of Mount Vernon, New York, Mayor Sean Patterson Howard. Uh, she's going to be leading the 10-year organization, 127 members. Uh, Sean, uh, glad to have you uh, on the show, Mayor. How you doing? Good to be here, and I am a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta in Incorporated. It's all good, you know. Alpha's all y'all, daddy. Don't worry about it. It's good. It's good. All right. So let's <laughs> let's get let's get right to it. So, um, so talk about what is your vision? What is your plan um, for? Because we see right now the four largest cities in the country, in the cities in the country: African American mayor, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and Houston. Uh, we have, of course, mayors, a black mayor in Atlanta, a mayor in Little Rock, and Birmingham, and just all, different places. So we are seeing. Uh, how black political power uh, is increasing. And so uh, what is your goal with these mayors? I mean, my goal with these mayors is to make sure that we're addressing issues that um, are critical to black communities, urban communities. And, you know, at the top of the list, dealing with climate change, dealing with public safety and community revitalization, looking at health, um, looking at generational wealth. These are the things that are at the top um, of my priority list. And the way that we would accomplish these things is definitely partnering with national organizations. I'm excited that we are going to be doing some work with the um, Congressional Black Caucus. We are partnering with the Gates Foundation, and we're doing work around um, wealth building and, and developing generational worth, wealth. We're working with the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, you know, in that same area and making sure that uh, properties in our communities, that we are retaining them as families and communities and ensuring um, the future strength economically of our communities. Looking at organizations like the NAACP and the Urban League, you know, how are we really partnering? How are we partnering on a national level? How are we aligning our vision? vision and our focus so that we stop working in silos, because oftentimes we're working in silos. We want to focus also, you know, on voting rights. That's very, very important, because if we lose the power of the vote and they continue to do all of this redistricting, um, it just dilutes our power and, of course, public safety, um, because we want to make sure that the blood stops running down the streets in the neighborhood in our communities because of unnecessary gun violence, um, oftentimes powered by this very illegal gun market. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that we're definitely looking at. And, uh, you know, when you have national organizations that you can work with, then it really just becomes a force multiplier. We have a 2024 presidential election coming up, and so we have to be very serious, very focused, and very intentional, intentional uh, about how we're moving. One of the things that, um, that 
uh, mayors always talk about, and I'm always trying to explain to people on this show how power works, is that when the federal government is sending money, typically they're sending that money in block grants to the states. Well, here's part of the problem. In many of these states where we have black mayors, you've got Republican governors, and they're not being sending that money to the states. And so one of the things that black mayors, the AAMA, uh, has been demanding or pushing the Biden-Harris uh, administration is to bypass the states and send the money directly to the cities if they want to impact the people. Absolutely. That's what we did with American Rescue Plan money. We sat with members of the Biden-Harris administration, and we just to the very point that you made, if you send it to the governors, it's not going to come here. Um, one of the points, uh, Houston and Dallas were hit hard by, you know, climate uh, incidents a few years ago, and Texas received a whole bunch of money. Um, none of that money made it to Houston and Dallas. Right. And those are largely black, black cities led by black mayors. Uh, and so we know that if the monies continue just to go to the governors, you're not going to see that money in the communities. And mayors are the ones that have to answer for the challenges in the community. They're the ones who can get the money directly to the needs. Um, that will impact their residents the most. And so getting money stuck at the state level is not good. Look, I'm in New York and we have a Democratic um, governor, but I feel as a mayor that I still know how my community needs to spend their money. Um, and I definitely still advocate, even in communities and states where there are Democratic governors, that the money still goes to mayors. Mayors are boots on the ground. We are the first line of government. We are the ones who have to answer to the people the most, and they have access to us. And so we should definitely have the leading say in how monies um, that are allocated by the federal government for our communities are spent. All right, questions from our panel. Rebecca, you're first. What's your question for Mayor Sean? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, there's a growing um, narrative that crime is on an uptick um, in the country, and that is centered around urban areas and largely um, in cities. Um, what types of support do our mayors need in order to make sure that we're stemming um, the increase in crime? Um, and that's me also assuming that, yes, there is an increase in crime that's happening in our cities um, all across the country. And like you said, that's that's assuming that there is an increase in crime. Actually, in a lot of our, our urban communities, we're seeing a decrease in violent crime. Unfortunately, what we see is over-reporting of crime. And even uh, the Post, which is not necessarily a friend, the New York Post is not necessarily a friend of urban communities, they spoke about, um, and the Times spoke about, how there is a lot of over-reporting of crime. And so there's about a 400% um, increase in reporting of crime. We saw four homicides in my community last year. Uh, they were all solved. We usually see anywhere between six and 10. So that is a decrease. Um, this year, we've seen three so far. The big challenge is that they're younger people. And so we have to definitely deal with the narrative that's being pushed. But then um, there is real crime that is happening. And so partnering with the uh, African-American mayors, the National League of Cities, working with organizations like Cities United um, that really focuses on understanding that violence is a public health issue. And so needing people like crime... Um, Violence interrupters. So we have violence interrupters in our community. We call them snug. And these are people who were justice involved, who are now out on the streets as outreach workers, connecting with those who are the most violent or potentially the most violent in our community um, to mentor them, to provide them with case management. Um, it's a real holistic view and holistic approach to reducing crime in our communities, education, jobs, job training, living wage jobs, working with them around mental health issues. A lot of these young people on the streets who are involved in criminal activities also experience a lot of trauma. And so we know that policing by itself has never deterred crime and stopped crime in communities. And so we definitely have to take a comprehensive approach um, to violence in our communities, very, very similar to what we did with COVID. 
when COVID came, everyone stopped what they were doing. They really focused, and you had you had everyone from DPW and police to hospitals to schools to neighborhood associations really focusing on how to keep our communities healthy. Well, that's the same thing that we have to do. Neighborhood watches have to come back again, but we have to train them and educate them. Um, we're bringing back in Mount Vernon, the peacekeepers. We've spoken to the church and some of the guys in the neighborhood and say, look, you know, this has to be done for us by us. Remember FUBU back in the day? And, and so if we don't want over-policing of our communities, then we have to also get out here and walk the streets and not be afraid to engage the young men and women in our our communities. We have to be serious about job training and education so that they can have living wage jobs because you can help people walk away from a life of crime, but if they don't have any way to take care of themselves and their families, they're going to find themselves back in street level activity. So it has to be much more. Um, and, and as Eric Adams always says, Mayor Adams, he says, we have to address the issues upstream. We have to deal with the drivers of violence. And there are very many drivers of violence, and we have to address them one by one. And that's some of the partnerships that we're really focusing on and, and bringing those resources to our mayors. Robert? Uh, and kind of piggybacking on Rebecca's point, and thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, we've seen a continuous uh, uh, attacks on black mayors around the country, from police uh, unions, from fraternal orders of police, uh, particularly against black female mayors. We saw Mayor Lightfoot and the issues she had in Chicago, uh, Mayor Bottoms in Atlanta, the issues she had after the Richard Brooks killing, uh, killing. What can be done to better bridge the gap between law enforcement and the uh, and the efforts at uh, criminal justice reform that many black mayors try the institute uh, nationwide, because it seems that we end up in this running circle of police officers not wanting to uh, fight crime. But whenever you try to institute, institute police reform, as a result, crime ticks up. Uh, the community gets angry. You, replete, you replace the politicians who are trying to push for uh, law enforcement reform, and we end up in the same spot again and again. What can be done to bridge that gap? Look, I mean, it's 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 hard conversations um, here in the city of Mount Vernon. I'm up right now for re-election in June. Uh, definitely having a lot of challenges with my PBA. Uh, New York was uh, definitely a criminal justice reform state. No more stop and frisk, uh, changing in bail reform and, and uh, discovery laws. And so we saw some of the same things. We saw kind of the blue flu, uh, not necessarily people not coming to work, but not writing tickets and doing things of that nature. Also in a lot of urban areas like my community, um, we're behind and, and we pay our police officers less. And so when you're trying to negotiate contracts and things of that nature, so anytime there's a shooting or there's a homicide, it's like, well, because we don't have enough police, um, the laws are too weak, uh, the mayors don't care about public safety. We absolutely care about public safety, but we want to just make sure that the rules and the way that we're dispensing justice are equitable. And you made the right point. Um, when communities see an uptick in violence, they're almost ready to give up all of the rights that we've gained around criminal justice reform to make sure that the neighborhoods are safe. Uh, and, and that's part of the game. That's, that's part of the constant drumbeat of the communities are not safe. And so when you're also looking at 24-hour news cycles and people are also looking at social media, if a shooting happens in Atlanta, then people in Mount Vernon are feeling it. They're like, they, there's just a constant feeling of, of unsafety. It doesn't have to even be violence happening in your community. They just look at it happening in any urban area, and they're feeling it. I have parents who are saying, we need SROs in the school. While we support SROs in the school, right now we don't have it in our budget. We don't have it available. But when there was the shooting in Uvalde, the news called us, and, and they were on the news every morning saying, well, we need to know how many school safety officers you're going to put in the schools because parents are afraid that the school is going to be shot up tomorrow. So there is a lot of pressure um, <laughs> to, to respond and to give much more funding to public safety, especially in urban communities that don't necessarily have the money. And so Mayor Tashara Jones and I always say that our communities, our cities are what we call the cop shop. 
um, other communities around us who can afford to pay more come to our community to get the well-trained officers. They're transferring out of our communities at a higher rate. And then that also becomes part of the narrative that you're allowing your cops to transfer, that you don't care about policing, you don't care about public safety. And it is definitely an attack on black women mayors. Uh, Scott, uh, I got, I got uh, Scott and Mayor, I got 60 seconds left in the segment. Uh, Scott, go. Yeah, and, and Madam Mayor, I, I agree with everything you said about the crime issue and solving it. But most of our urban centers, big or small, still have a crime problem. Absolutely. And it's very expensive. It's very expensive to solve this problem because I agree with everything you said. How do you get more money in your budgets from the feds, from the state, to solve that problem? Because to me, that answers a lot of questions if you get the funding for it. Well, we are definitely lobbying our state officials, and I'm excited. And I'm, I'm encouraged by the Safer Communities Act that is mm -hmm. putting forward a lot more money on the federal government. And so we're working to make sure that our urban communities are receiving the technical assistance. And uh, when we're talking about Justice 40, our communities are under-resourced and underserved, and we need mm -hmm. our fair share of that money. All yeah. right, then. Good luck, Madam uh, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, uh, Sean, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a bunch. Uh, folks, coming up next, we're going to talk with uh, Dee Barnes uh, about her new show on the Black Star Network. Uh, but before we go, Scott, I got one more message for you. You keep campaigning for this ass whooping, you're going to get elected. Oh, you didn't hear it? Oh, you didn't hear it, Scott? No, you, you, you should run that again. I didn't hear it. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, oh, I'm going to run that again. Here we go. You keep campaigning for this ass whooping, you're going to get elected. <laughs> <laughs> that also was Orlando Jones from Double Take. I'll be right back. <laughs> I like that one. I like that. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, what does it mean to actually have balance in your life? Why is it important and how do you get there? A masterclass on the art of balance. It could change your life. Find the harmony of your life. And so what beat can you maintain at a good pace? What cadence can keep you running that marathon? Because we know we're going to have you know, high levels, we're going to have low levels, but where can you find that flow, that harmonious pace? That's all next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Up next on The Frequency with me, D Barnes, we're going to talk to Leslie Seagar, a.k.a. Big Les, and talk about her incredible career as a dancer, choreographer, and DJ of Rap City. Magic Johnson was there, so half the NBA was there. Iman the supermodel, so all the supermodels were there every day. After right. Like, it was a who's who of who's who. Right here on The Frequency in the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Arnaz Jake. Black TV does matter, dang it. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Stay woke. Now, pay attention, and you might learn something. For Scott Bolden right there. All right, pay attention, you might learn something, Scott. All right, folks, my next guest, uh, pioneer in hip-hop, uh, hosted a show uh, years ago uh, that was uh, all the rage in hip-hop, and then all of a sudden, she was a journalist, uh, and then uh, many people may know her story uh, when it came to uh, uh, her and Dr. Dre and uh, uh, where, she, where she was viciously beaten. Uh, she dropped off the radar for uh, quite some time, but now she's back and has a show called The Frequency on the Black Stud Network. What's up, D Barnes? How you doing? What's up, Roland? You looking sharp right there with the uh, the white fedora. Oh, I figure, I figure, <laughs> I, figure we'd, I figure we'd do something. This is one of the this is one of the brims George Lopez gave me at his golf tournament uh, a couple years ago. So you know, I said I, I figure I'd make Scott Bolden a little jealous. I make Scott Bolden a little jealous because he mad. Why are you on Scott? Why are you on Scott so bad? Because he a little capper, and and you know he jealous. He jealous. 
Oh, okay. All right. All right. He, he's All jealous. Right. Yo, turn, turn Scott back up. Come on. Uh, he over there running his mouth saying something. I don't know what the hell he's saying. Defend yourself, Scott. Come on, turn the audio up. Oh, no, you did that, Roland. Hey, hey, <laughs> hey Scott, your silly ass on mute. See, you're a captain. Hey, no, I said, you think you're so pretty. You can't be that pretty because you're not a capper. So just keep it moving. Keep the show moving. Wow. See? <laughs> This is, this is this is gentleman beef. This is gentleman beef. Yeah. No, no, it's yeah, only hate, it's only one. I'm no, it's only one gentleman. There's a gentleman and there's a child. Okay. <laughs> oh wow. And trust me, I tower over Scott. We'll leave that alone. All right, D. Uh, so uh, so let's let's get get right into it. Uh, for fo so for folks who don't know uh, your history, what you what you used to do in media, just uh, share it with the folks who are watching. Uh, you know, I used to be an MC with a group called Body and Soul on the label Delicious Vinyl. You might have heard it, Tone Loke, Young MC, Def Jeff, uh, the brand new heavies, Far Side, uh, a lot of Jay Dilla product, uh, you know, productions. Um, and then from there, I went on to host a show called Pump It Up, which was similar to Yo MTV Raps, Rap City. Um, and we were on the Fox Network at the time. This is the, like the early, you know. Uh, late 80s, early 90s. And um, from there, you know, I, I interviewed so many of the, your favorite hip hop artists all through the, you know, the 90s. The show was on for about three years. Uh, and then uh, you then you were also, uh, what, writing for publications uh, and you, you were still uh, in the game. Uh, but then all of a sudden you disappeared from media. Oh, what definitely happened? disappeared. Definitely disappeared from media. I mean, people know the story of the incident that I had with uh, Dr. Dre, which had a, a you know uh, a very uh, looming effect over myself, my career, and uh, you know it's been a long struggle to get back here. And um, you came to me with this opportunity, which I, you know, at first I, I hesitated because uh, when we were talking to Angela. No, 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 D. You didn't, D. You didn't hesitate. You said no. I was like, what is wrong with her? Oh, you know, I had a lot of people in this industry come at me and offer me things, and you know, things didn't work out. It, like I was saying, it was just I felt a little, you know, like maybe I was a little jaded with the industry, so to speak, and I had this focus that I was, you know. I was focused on this one thing, and you helped me realize that you know I need to to reel it in, and and reset, reboot. And so you came with me with this opportunity to do this show, and I'm like, okay, let's do it. So, let's do it. So know? so so let me tell y'all what I said to D. I said, listen, a lot of people call me, and I said, uh, I, I mean, one of my gifts is getting people unstuck. Sometimes a lot of people sort of just sort of stuck where they are. They don't actually see the whole chessboard. Uh, they don't see things uh, the same way. And so, uh, and so initially D said, no, nah, I'm just gonna focus on trying to get my book and my, and my documentary. And I was like, D, listen, those are long-term projects that take two, three, four, five years or even longer. Uh, and so, so I was trying to figure out uh, wh wh what to say to her that, that, that would make it click. And so God gave me this one. I said, D, let me explain to you. You <laughs> like somebody who's trying to swim from this island to that island way over there and my ass in a boat. And I roll up on you and you like, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm going to swim it. And I'm like, you might want to get your ass in this boat to get over to that <laughs> island a little faster. And, and that, that's what caused her to go, dang, you right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's because I was drowning. <laughs> I was drowning. And when you, when you were like, you going to get in this boat? And I was like, you know what? <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> Let's get in this boat. No, but no, you did come to me with uh, some good knowledge about getting people unblocked, not stuck, you said, you said unblocked. And I felt that that was happening to me for years in the industry, that I was being blocked. Um, whether it was me or whether it was, you know, from the industry. But, you know, speaking to you and speaking to, you know, Dr. Jackie Martin, um, shout out to her, she helped me get balance. And if you guys, you know, are fans of the Black Star Network, I know you watch her show, A Balanced Life. And speaking to both of you helped me get balanced and refocus. And then it was I was able to start 
you know, thinking about what I wanted to do with this platform you were offering me. And it definitely was something about uplifting women. That was my focus. I wanted to uplift women. I want to pass the mic to women that haven't been heard. I want to speak to, you know, my elders. I want to speak to my peers. I want to speak to the younger generation, you know, issues of concern that deal with women. That that's like my main, my main goal. Like my first guest right there was Alicia Garza. You know what I mean? I want to focus on uh, books because you see books are being banned left and right. So I really want to work with a lot of women, um, you know, who work on, you know, write books. And then you see, ah, there goes Big Les. I also, you know, being that it's the 50th anniversary of hip hop, I got to throw some hip hop in there. And I really want to talk to a lot of the legends in the game and a lot of the ones that have not been heard. You know what I mean? The ones you don't think of, a lot of the matriarchs, a lot of the, the pioneers, the, o, the OGs. So that's my focus. That's what I'm working on. You know what I mean? The show is basically uh, an intersection of, of empowerment and acknowledgement. You know what I'm saying? In a safe space. And, and so. the, thing, the thing that, and, and, and again, for the people who are watching, um, uh, I mean, understand, I've never personally met Dee. I follow her on no. social media. I saw her story. And and I say, you know what? I say, I think this could be interesting. Uh, because wow. I mean, you've had to you've had to deal uh with um look, uh being 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 homeless, you've had to deal with yeah. uh again, as you said, being blackballed, jobless. uh mm -hmm. jobless, a lot of people again who who promised things and didn't didn't follow through. Uh, right. and, and one of the things, and I, and I got to shout before we go to the break, we'll come back. I got to shout out Fab Five Freddy and Sway. That's right. Because what happened was, um, so what happened was when I had this idea, so I called Fab Five Freddy. Yeah. I called Sway. I called oh, Sway. Dream Hampton. Yes. I Dream called Kev Kev I called Kevin Powell. Because I was like, because what? And, and just for everybody to understand, so I went through these Twitter and Instagram feed to look for people who follow her who I knew. Mm -hmm. And so I was like... Well, listen, you picked, you picked people that... You picked key people because those people have always supported me and have always uh, counseled me and helped me in ways that I can't even describe. So you picked some key people. <laughs> you picked some good people that, that so, were able to, to talk to me. Right, so I, so I picked them and so I, we talked to them and they were like, yo, Roland, this is a great idea. Man, this could be awesome. Fab Five Freddy loved it. And then when D said, nah, I'm good, I'm gonna keep doing this. See, I was like, er? <laughs> so then I called, I, 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 then I hit all four of them back. Fab Five was like, what? And so then, uh, and then a little bit later, he hit me up, and he was like, yo, he said, I ran, he said, I hollered at D. I think she's straight now. Uh, and so uh, he, uh, so just before we go to the break, just share for folks what happened when he was like, D. <laughs> no, you know, Fat Fi is a great brother. You know what I'm saying? He's one of the brothers that I can, in the industry, is my, my hip-hop brother for life, that I can call up and talk to, and he'll give me the real, the straight up. You know what I mean? And it's just like you said, we hadn't met. So I didn't really didn't know you. So as you were vetting me, I was vetting you too, brother. I was like, well, well how is Roland? How is he? You know, so it's weird because we haven't met, but I feel like I know you. You know what I mean? And you got a good review. You got a good review. You got a great review. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't worried about that. I wasn't worried about that. I, I knew. I thought you wasn't. That's why you're in the white right now. I, I, I knew we were going to I knew what we could do. Uh, yes. And that's one of the reasons why, again, uh, you know, creating the platform is important because to be able to do different things in different voices. Hold on one second. I got to go to break, pay some bills. We come okay. back. Uh, my panel got some questions for you. We're talking with Dee Barnes. She's host of the new show on the Black Star Network, the new weekly show. Uh, but it's a weekly now. Uh, but we're gonna move to two to three times a week, but eventually, hopefully uh, in about three months, she, we're gonna be actually daily. So the plan is for her to have a daily show here on the Black Star Network. It will be the third daily show that we have. And so we'll chat with her next right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered back in a moment. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, Nurses are the backbone of the healthcare industry, and yet only 7% of them are black. What's the reason for that low number? Well, a lack of opportunities and growth in their profession. Joining us on the next Get Wealthy is Needy Bartonelli. She's gonna be sharing exactly what nurses need to do and what approach they need to take 
to take ownership of their success. So the Black Nurse Collaborative really spawned from a place and a desire to create opportunities to uplift each other, those of us in the profession, to also look and reach back and create, and create pipelines and opportunities for other nurses like us. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hey everybody, it's your man Fred Hammond. Hi, my name is Brisha Webb, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Ow. Well, I like a nice filter usually, but we can be unfiltered. Now, Kira Ellis has been missing from Lyman, South Carolina, since February 17th. The 17-year-old is 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighs 200 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. Her hair was in black and orange braids when she was last seen. Nakira wears glasses and a nose ring. Anyone with information about Nakira Ellis should call the Lyman, South Carolina Police Department at 864-596-2222, 864-596-2222. All right, folks, back to our conversation with Dee Barnes, host of the show, The Frequency, right here on the Black Star Network, debut last Thursday. Uh, new episodes will drop every single Thursday. Uh, so glad to have her here. Uh, uh, D, the, I, I talk about one of the things that I one of the things that I said to you, and and, and this really was important uh, because because it was sort of like how again as somebody from the outside who's following you, it was as if it was as if your story stopped with mm. with uh the beating with Dr. Dre. And mm -hmm. and 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 I said from my perspective that cannot that cannot be the end of your story. I said the opportunity right. here is to be able to have a platform to be able to talk about issues, talk about things that you've gone through, things that you've endured, mm -hmm. how you can empower others that now that, that writes new chapters. And, and, and so can, can yeah. you talk about why that's also important? Because, again, the people, if people Google you, like, literally, mm -hmm. all of the things you were doing and all you were involved in, everything just literally stopped right. after that. I mean, one of the things you did point out about, you know, speaking from my perspective and trying to change my... You were saying that it was... Uh, I had a narrow view and I only wanted to like, cover hip hop, but that wasn't true. But you were absolutely right in the fact that I could broaden my view and broaden the conversation about the things that I went through. And I think that one of the things that people love, you know, tuning into is that um, I want to like I want to invoke empathy, so you can relate to what was happening. So having the experience of being homeless, you know, what I mean, I hope to talk to some advocates about that having the experience of, you know, um, being jobless and the struggles in the industry. A lot of women in this industry, in the entertainment industry is what I mean, um, and what they go through, you know what I mean? Like right now, I have a few friends that are writers and they're dealing with the writer strike right now. So I want to talk to them and get their perspective on, you know, how they're dealing with that. So I think, you know, that the, the advice that you've given me and, you know, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to have this platform so that I can reach, you know, more people and talk about some interesting things. And we're going to have some explosive conversations. I mean, that that's really, really my focus, my goal. I want to have explosive conversation. Like I was talking about my favorite, you know, poetry from uh, Sonia Sanchez, the home girls and hand grenades. That's what it's about. I want to have that conversation in a safe space and, you know, perhaps maybe help people um, you know, with the conversation to elevate them and to lift them up. You know, we get a lot of low vibrational things happening in the world. You know, you just showed that the young sister that's missing and never really 
that really hurt me for just that, that five seconds because I'm thinking about, you know, my little nieces and um, nephews. You know what I mean? So there's so much negativity in the world, and I really want to just put something out there that's positive. And I hope people tune in, and I hope they, you know, they get, they get into it. They get, they got to tune in. They got to tune in. I'm trying to raise the vibration of the conversation, you know, and evoke empathy. Well, that's one of the reasons why we have that segment, because, frankly, it's a lot of black folks who are missing and never get talked about, never get reported. And so we do it every single day. Let's go to our questions. Rebecca, your question for D Barnes. Dee, thank you so much for joining us tonight. So there is a lot of uh, former hip hop artists who are now transitioning into um, content creation. And so a lot of us listen to them. Like a lot of us devoured the complex list that was listing the most influential hip hop um, artists who are now podcasters and other content. So you have Wallow and Gilly and Joe Budden and Math Hoffa mm. and Noriega. So based upon with how you're formatting your show, what will set you apart from some of the other folks in the game? Well, just the fact that you just named a lot of men in particular. I don't think enough women in hip hop get that platform. I don't think that they're heard at all. And that's one of my main focuses and goal is to pass the mic to, you know, women in hip hop, women in the music industry, women in entertainment, just, you know, pass the mic to them and have them tell and share their stories and their struggles. You know what I mean? Because so, we can all relate to that. But that's how I'm going to stand out from everybody else, because a lot of the focus is on the men. And then when we do uh, talk to the women, there's only a few of them. You know, so I want to make sure we talk to as many people as I possibly can. And I'm, it's not that I'm not going to have men on the show. I just want to focus on the women because I feel like we're the ones that are are not heard. That's why I'm rocking, you know, my Malcolm X right here. We're the most, you know, disrespected uh, unprotected and neglected, you know, demographic in in America. And so I really want to, you know, bring that focus back to women and issues that impact them. Uh, Scott. D, congratulations. I'm sorry. Hey, D, congratulations on your show. Um, you. I don't know your story, but I will certainly uh, review it or, or, or look for it. Uh, but I know about success and failure. And right. I believe the Lord takes us down before he brings us up. And so mm -hmm. with this new venture, how would you define success for the show? And how do you define success vis-a-vis -vis your life generally? Success for the show, I believe, would be um, just having people tune in, just having people pay attention and support, you know, Black-owned media. The fact that I was out for so long in the industry and I'm coming back on black owned media, you can't tell me there isn't a guy. God is so good. And I and, you know, it makes me so proud and happy to be part of this network. You know what I mean? This is this is a historical thing. This is, you know, black owned media, black star network. Come on. You 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 can't you can't tell me there isn't a guy. God is good. All all the time all the time, all the God is good. I'm all the time. God is good. You know, so hopefully I, I have people, you know, tune in when people start realizing that, you know, I'm back on the air. So I'll have a lot of people that used to watch me and then hopefully bring in new, you know, new viewers. And we'll see. We're going to grow from there, especially going from a weekly to, you know, a couple of days to a daily show. This is going to be interesting. I've never been on the air, you know, uh, daily. So this is going to be something, you know, it's a new adventure, new challenge for me. And I'm, I'm so grateful to, you know, Roland for giving me this opportunity and for the people that, you know, said good things about me <laughs> to, to Roland to help me get to this point. Thank you. Thank you all. Indeed. Robert Patillo, what you got? I, I want to kind of circle back to what you were saying about highlighting female MCs. Again, congratulations. We're all Thank looking forward to the, the show coming up. Uh, but, you know, I think we've kind of had a race to the bottom with uh, these Gen Z female MCs uh, with some of the lyrics, some of the visuals, et cetera. Uh, what, what can be done to highlight some of the f positive female MCs and artists, particularly younger ones who are, are out there and who exist, but they're not getting the same attention as, you know, Suki Hana or Sexy Red or... Uh, uh, you know, some of these more vulgar female rappers who are basically taking misogyny from male rappers and just wrapping it in female packaging and then making the same white executive rich as always. How can we highlight positive female MCs? Well, I'm definitely going to be platforming a lot of, 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 a lot of uh, positive female MCs, but I want to circle back to what you said because you brought up the fact that 
um, just women are talking like this, when there's plenty of men that talk like that. And I'm sure, I'm, I don't know if you've ever brought up the fact that a lot of the men talk about this and talk about violence and talk about, you know, misogyny. So now that the women have taken that, um, you know, tone, I don't think that they should be looked down upon. But what I do want to do is open up and broaden it to these other women out there that are speaking, you know, higher, higher uh, subject matters, different subject matters. And they're not being heard, which is why I'm talking about passing the mic to them. There's so many women, you know, like we never talk about Rhapsody enough. We never talk about Chica, uh, Sarak, Bahamadia. There's so many women out there that um, it's just not that what you're just, you know, pointing out about that type of um, music. And then on the other tip, too, I feel like, you know, women owning their sexuality and their agency, there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But there needs to be balance. I do agree with you that there needs to be balance. But there's nothing wrong about a woman owning her sexuality. You know what I mean? You might find it vulgar, but there's other, um, you know, we can talk about old school comedians that were vulgar. Um, you know, I'm thinking in particular like a Red Fox or a Dolomite. Those are vulgar, you know, things that they said, you know what I mean? But nobody, it's coming down on them in particular. So when women do it, when we have like a, a Millie Jackson, for instance, who was considered very vulgar, <laughs> but she still, you know, got her point. Uh, no, M Millie wasn't considered vulgar. Millie <laughs> will tell you I was. <laughs> I mean, and you know, what's wrong with that? You know what I mean? But no, first I of all, I love, I love me some Millie, because Millie, I used, to, I used to be on the radio with Millie. We were on the same radio station in Dallas, KKDA Radio. She's in Atlanta. I was a news director, morning anchor there. Uh, and boy, and, 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 but Millie didn't care, and Millie still don't care. Right, exactly. I, you know, I just, I understand your point. I just don't want it to be, oh, we're just going to come down on these women because they, you know, this is an image that they're projecting. Because this image was there before hip hop or music, you know, was out there. This is, this is something that's, you know, in society in general. We just need to have balance, and hopefully, on a platform that, uh, like the frequency, we will have balance because we will talk to other women on different other subjects. You know what I mean? D, we appreciate it, folks. The Frequency, uh, we'll drop a new episode every Thursday, every Thursday right here on Roland Martin, uh, excuse me, on the Black Star Network. Uh, and again, uh, right now it's a weekly, but we'll be building up uh, in, uh, hopefully in 90 days, we'll be uh, five days a week uh, with five D Barnes. Uh, D, we appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. And welcome Thank to, welcome, so much, welcome to BSN. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Black Star Network. All Thank right. Thank you. Got to go to a break. We come back. Tech Talk. That's next. Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Up next on The Frequency with me, D. Barnes, we're going to talk to Leslie Seagar, a.k.a. Big Les, and talk about her incredible career as a dancer, choreographer, and DJ of Rap City. Magic Johnson was there, so half the NBA was there. Iman the supermodel, so all the supermodels were there every day. After right. the, like, it was a who's who of who's who right here on The Frequency in the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness, and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please, support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hey, I'm Cupid, the maker of the Cupid Shuffle and the Wham Dance. What's going on? This is Tobias Trevelyan. And if you're ready, you are listening to and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
many folks are cash poor, meaning they have limited savings and live, live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, in those situations, they find it difficult to actually borrow money from a bank or another financial institution. Solo funds, they are trying to change that by helping underserved communities access necessary resources around securing capital and building on it. Solo Funds, head of regulatory and government affairs, Kyle George, is here to explain how the first black-owned fintech company can help you gain financial independence. Uh, Kyle, so uh, thanks a bunch. First of all, who owns? Who owns uh, Solo Funds? Hey, Roland, it's good to be on. Thanks for having us. Um, Solo Fund is, is owned by two, two brothers, two black men, Travis and Rodney, um, who identified a need in our communities. They came from the communities that we serve, meaning communities that have little to no access to short-term capital. They identified a problem. They saw it firsthand um, among their family and their loved ones, and they came up with a solution to address it. Uh, when did they start it? 2018. We've been around since 2018. Uh, and so, uh, and, and so, in terms of, uh, so, so walk us through in terms of uh, what they do. Look, there are people out there. They understand the concept of pawn shops, of payday lenders. Uh, they understand. So the question, so, so somebody's watching, going or listening, going, okay, how do I access solo funds? How do I reach them? How do I communicate with them? Yeah, so th those are the most familiar things we turn to when we need short-term capital, right? In, in our communities, they're, they're, they're quite pervasive. We see a lot of title loan companies, pawn shops, um, payday lenders. And the problem with this is that these are all predatory solutions that aren't there to benefit us. What they, they do, they often put us into a debt spiral that make, things, make us worse off than when we started. What Solo does, on the other hand, we've taken a solution that's familiar to our community. We've taken the same solution that we, we see in our churches, where we go to our neighbors to borrow money when, when we're in need. Uh, so Solo is a microloan community lending platform. And what that means is that we connect borrowers who need short-term loans with lenders who might have a little bit of extra cash this month and want to help out. So what the borrowers get is access to small dollar loans that banks don't want to touch. We're talking about amounts as little as 20 bucks up to 575 and the lenders in turn get to actually make some money instead of having their money sit stagnant into in a bank account so we're connecting people with each other people who have money with people who need money and uh, help each other out so the least amount you can access is 20 bucks and the maximum is 575 is that per 30 days is that i mean so what about that yeah, so that's a great question. So basically, we allow our users one loan at a time. So every borrower, I'm sorry, we allow our borrowers access to one loan at a time. We don't want them to overextend themselves. We want to make sure that they aren't getting into a situation where they can't repay. So as soon as they repay that, that loan, they're eligible to take another one out. So we've built a lot of safeguards into our product to make sure that our users don't get themselves in trouble. So uh, the first thing we do when you're new to the platform, the amount you can borrow is small. You might be capped at, let's say, $100, for example. Once you satisfactorily pay that back, and, and to be clear, this is when I say short term, we're talking up to 35 days max. So you can tell me, hey, Roland, I want to borrow 20 bucks for a week. I need gas money just to get to work this week. And you can say, yeah, I'll help you. I, I'll do that. As soon as I pay you back that $20 in seven days, I can then turn around and, and borrow more money when the need arises. So one loan at a time, but you can do it as often as you wish. So uh, now uh, y'all are operating, but then several states, hey, hey, they said slow down, um, what, D.C., Connecticut, and others, uh, because they didn't understand what your, what your business model, because you're in a business that is regulated uh, by, uh, by, by the government, uh, but those things have been cleared, correct? Yes. So to be clear, we uh, last week Friday we announced a uh, resolution on um, and an, an ability to resume operations in the District of Columbia. That was really big. So that's one of the reasons I came on board with this company. I think the biggest problem that that companies like us face is that regulators don't understand what we do. We're innovative. We're new, and by definition, new is unfamiliar. So what happened is, when they, when places like DC first looked at our model, they had concerns. Wait a minute. What do you mean you don't charge interest? That can't be right. So they they asked us um, to, to to pause operations. We voluntarily agreed to pause operations in DC specifically, and we spent the last few months. Um, 
talking out of them. Hey, look, let me explain what we do, how we're different. And um, as a result of these discussions, we're able to announce our settlement last Friday. Questions from the panel. Scott, you're first. Hi, good evening. Um, let me start. Listen, uh, I'm based in D.C. Normally, the attorney general's office goes after companies, payday, payday loan companies for charging exorbitant uh, interest. I didn't know they were going after those who uh, companies, finance companies that don't. That's that's a bit surprising. But how do you make money at this? How does anybody make money with this business model? Yeah, there are several different ways that we make money. So first of all, um, borrowers have the option to donate money to us. You, we, we're familiar with that model. We see GoFundMe when you you donate to a charitable cause. When you you fund a charitable cause, they say, "Hey, look, we have cost as a platform. Do you mind donating some money to pay our overhead?" So we offer that okay. to our audience as well. That's one of the ways we make money. The other thing we do is we want to make sure that our lenders have some sort of head against um, the against to make sure that the loans are paid. So what they can do, some uh, lenders are given the option to insure the loan, if you will. It's not insurance. It's it's just an easy, familiar paradigm. But they can they can buy our solo protection. So if the borrower does not pay it, we will give them credit that allows them to regain most of their money. So the company makes money on that as well. So those are two of the ways that we make money right now. And as we grow as a company, we have some other ways that will come online. Uh, Rebecca. Thank you. How can someone become a lender? And what is the minimum investment that someone has to do in order to become a lender? So anyone um, in a state that we're operate, operating can sign up. You can download the app. Uh, you can go to solofunds.com, first of all. That's our website. You can download the app on the Android store, the Apple store. Um, we're, we're available in those states where we're operational. Once you sign up, and when you sign up, you go through a lot of similar questions um, that you will when you sign up for bank accounts, because we are regulated um, under those. We are subject to those same laws as banks. You know your customer, anti-money laundering, and so on. So once you sign up for it, you have a choice. Do I want to lend or do I want to borrow? And depending on your circumstances, you might do both. Many of our customers, in fact, do both at different points in their lives. Once you're on the platform, you can lend as many times as you want to as many users as you want, uh, up to you. There's no cap on lending, but we do ladder up on borrowing. Robert. Uh, it's, uh, this seems like a very, a very interesting process, if nothing else. How does this affect the credit score, both for the borrower and for the lender? Uh, would this be a way for people to build their credit up by taking out micro loans and paying them back immediately or by uh, issuing out loans? So the answer is not yet. Um, it's, it's a great question because it really exposes a flaw in our system of credit scores. So, so we... Unfortunately, um, did I lose you? Like we keep going, we lost your video. I think we skipped okay. your audio. Go ahead. Okay, I apologize for that. So we wanted to report this data to the credit bureaus because this is a great way for our users to build their credit history. Unfortunately, the the credit bureaus told us that because our loans were repaid in a single installment, in a single payments, not installment payments, it can't be reported. So. Because of that, we can't report to the credit bureaus. But because of that, we also don't report adverse payments to the credit bureaus. If we can't report the good stuff, we're not going to report the bad stuff. It just, it's just a fair thing to do. All right. So somebody's watching. They want to uh, contact Solo Funds. How do they do so? Well, go to our website, solofunds.com. Solofunds.com. Yes, sir. All right, Kyle. We certainly appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks oh. for the opportunity. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Let me thank uh, Scott, Robert, and Rebecca for being on today's show. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, and thank all of you for watching as well. Uh, leave it in the comments. So be sure to hit the like button on YouTube. Don't forget, folks, download our app, Apple Phone, Android Phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Support us in what we do by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Send your checking money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered.
Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zell, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. And of course, be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available at bookstores nationwide. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Ben Bella Books, IndieBound, Bookshop, Chapters, Books A Million, Target, download your copy on Audible will be. Uh, so that, again, get the copy of your book. Folks, I'll see you tomorrow right here on the Black Star Network. Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. Stay black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Jebra Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network.